Is this an incredible day in Tunisia? Has this been an incredible day? Yeah. Right. And is this an incredible time for women in Tunisia right now? Yeah. Right. That's what we're going to talk about. OK. Woo, we're already ahead. I was in my late 20s when I realized that the world was built by and for white, straight men. Every law, every system, every structure was for them. And the rest of us have had to fight our way into those. In fact, every week I get emails that say, look, the first woman has done this. We're, we still have things we haven't done. Women have not achieved things, like the presidency in the United States, for example. We still have work to do, right? We have so many things to do, and we're told every day that we should be grateful for what we've been given. We have been given rights. We were not granted rights. I just want to remind you all of that. I'm going to tell you stories today about women that have done incredible, remarkable things in very male spaces and who are extending that space to others. So it's not just the first woman to do something. It's a woman who's done something, and they're making that path easier for others to follow. Those are the stories I want to hear. Let's talk a little bit about where we are right now. Okay, women's achievements in education have been increasing. We have been getting more degrees and more advanced degrees than men since the 1970s. That's pretty remarkable. I know a lot of you here in the room are students that I've met in the last month. I am so applauding each of you. That education will allow you to make more money over your lifetime you will have better, higher paying jobs. You will stay in the workforce longer. You will have your children later in life. You will marry later in life. And you will have fewer children because your career and your education will also give you options that other women don't have. You will also earn more money in your lifetime than men without advanced degrees. That in and of itself should be a motivator for you ladies, right? OK. <laughs> and every man in the room should be encouraging every woman that they know, not just their sisters, not just their daughters, every woman they know to complete all of those degrees, get them scholarships, get them into education. I just completed an analysis of the Fortune 50, the most profitable companies in the world. I looked at who makes up their boards of directors, who makes up their leadership teams. There is one company that has a 50-50 gender split, women to men, on their board. That's pretty horrible, right? And when I looked at this, the reason I did this research was to confirm some of the things that I suspected and also to set that baseline. No one else, to my knowledge, and if you know anyone who's done it, please tell me, I was not able to find any research that looked at these two parameters together. I'm going to share some of the other findings with you. Ooh. I'm leaning in. Do you see that? OK. This is the kind of thing, right, that we see. Four of those companies have all white teams. They have women but no people of color, no people that are non-white. We as consumers, we as shareholders, and we as employees need to start holding companies accountable for this. We need to stop buying the products or buy the products from the companies that are advancing women and promoting women. There are a lot of companies right now, particularly in the United States, that are pushing programs on diversity, programs on women's leadership, come to our seminar, we'll show you how to do this. If you look at who those companies are, a lot of them are still run by men. So you're sending your women to these programs, and who's profiting? Who's making the money? It's the men. Don't do that. Keep looking. I can help you, right? 
I can help you find the companies that you want to do that work. Okay, this is another one. This is where, again, let's look at what we're doing, who we're doing it with, and why. There are 18 of these companies, of the Fortune 50, that's almost half, that have no non-white women running their company, right? That, for me, is an embarrassment. That should be an embarrassment for all those 18, and the other ones? probably have one non-white woman, if at all, and she's probably running HR. Okay, I'm, I'm, this clicker's been worn out today, guys. This is the one that kills me. So a month ago, we had four women CEOs in the Fortune 50. A month ago, we had four. The only non-white woman CEO, Indra Nui from Pepsi, announced last month that she was stepping down. We lost the only non-white woman in the Fortune 50. That, for me, is an embarrassment and terrible. I don't know if you guys were aware of that, that she's the only one. The other thing about this, the same quarter that she announced she was stepping down, General Motors, who's the company I referred to earlier that has the 50-50 gender split, they have a woman CEO, Mary Barra, she's also the chair of their board. She appointed a female CFO, a female of Indian descent. So a woman of color in the CFO job and a woman as the CEO. Do you know how many other companies in the Fortune 500 have a woman CEO and a woman CFO? One other, one other. Hershey, and it's 2018. In 500 companies, we have two. This is where I want you guys to really pay attention. I alluded to it a little bit before, but you have power in your pocket. Women in Tunisia are entering the workforce at higher numbers and staying in the workforce in higher numbers. They are getting higher levels of education. Woot woot. They are getting higher literacy rates than ever before. So women in Tunisia are rising. You don't need me, the American, to tell you that. You know that you're here because you believe that. What I want you to do is start paying attention to who you're spending your hard-earned money on. You're making that money. Make it and use it to benefit and better other women in the workforce. Yes. Yes. <laughs> We're just getting started. The night before I launched my business in 2015 was the finals for the Women's World Cup in soccer. I don't know how many of you follow women's global soccer, but I love the sport. I love the women's national team. Abby Wambach is one of the key players for the women's game. She retired. That game, she hardly played. I watched that game, and again, I had a whole campaign for launching this business women's empowerment, you know, women in the workforce, we're gonna change the world. And I watched this game and I thought, where is Happy Wombach? Why isn't she playing? She knew that her time was coming. She knew that her career was sunsetting. And she knew that there were other women on the team that could have a better shot of bringing that trophy home for the team. They won that game. Professional generosity is the tenant from which I built my business. The idea being that we all can give opportunities and experiences that will benefit other people without us having to benefit. Kind of a radical concept, right? Particularly in the world of work where we're all hyper-competitive and trying to gut each other for different projects and different assignments. But if you think about what professional generosity means, it's taking that person who works on the data but you're the client-facing person, bring them to that client meeting. Share that experience with them. Show the client who's actually producing the work behind the scenes. Use your power and your position to elevate other people wherever possible. It may break some systems. You may be told that you're not supposed to bring this person to a client. Don't listen to that, right? Do your thing. Do what you know is the right thing for that person. Excuse me. This is right out of the research from the work that I do with my consulting firm. 
And I've learned that we can segment the workforce into three broad categories, one of them being the advocates. I sense that a lot of you in the room are advocates. We challenge systems, we ask hard questions, we demand a lot from our employers, right? We want to see change, we want to keep moving forward. That's about 20%. There's another 20% at the other side that I call the resistors. I don't want you to tell me, you don't have to raise your hand if you're a resistor, but you know who they are. They're the ones that don't want anything to change. They don't want new software. They don't want to go to training. They don't want to go to diversity learning. They don't want anything to ever change. They're also valuable because there are people that need to do the work and not always be challengers, right? You want to change your corporate culture? There's that group in the middle that I call the silent 60%. They're the ones that watch everything. They pay attention to the advocates, they watch the political wins, and they don't issue their own opinions, but they know what's happening. Instead of trying to get everyone in your massive corporate environment on board with a culture change, if you focus on 10 to 20% of that 60%, your culture will change, right? So it's a lot less intimidating when we frame it that way. I want to talk to you a little bit about these women that I alluded to earlier. I'm writing a book about these women. I've got all stories, all different industries. I don't have time, particularly because I'm the last speaker today, to go through all of them with you. But I'm going to share a few. And what I want you to listen for is what from these stories can you take back to your learnings, to your environments, and start to incorporate or share with other people around you. There's a woman in the United States named Laura Ackman. She is an NFL sideline reporter, which means in American football, which is all men on the field, all men referees, all male coaches, and mostly men sportscasters, she was one of the first women about 20 years ago to get that job. She knows football better than most of the men in my life. She started to realize that when the NFL was hiring women for those jobs, they were younger, they were cute, they were perky, but they didn't know the sport. So instead of Laura saying, eh, my time is up, right? Maybe it's time for me to retire, move on, do something different. She stayed on the sidelines, but she started a training camp for other women, for these younger women. So instead of being threatened by them, she's helping them get better. And by doing that, she's helping the entire a ecosystem of football and women's sports casting get better. I think that's pretty powerful. Yeah. Right? <laughs> this is a quote from a woman who has started her own venture capital firm. If you read Fast Company, she happens to be on the cover this month, which is pretty remarkable, right? Fast Company beat me to the scoop, but that's okay. Arlen Hamilton has a venture capital firm. She is a woman of color. She is a lesbian. She only invests in women, people of color, and LGBT founders. The world of venture capital in the United States is exorbitantly white and male investing in white males. This quote is Arlen saying, someone's going to figure this out eventually, what I'm on to and how underestimated is her word, all of these founders are, and then you're gonna get out your buckets and you're gonna catch the rain, right? She's remarkable. So if you see Fast Company, pick it up and read more about her, because she's incredible. There's another woman named Elisa Bobot who has a coffee company, great product. I say my entire personality runs on caffeine, right? So I love coffee. She took over her family's coffee business and she knew she wanted to make it her own. So what she did is she decided she was going to invest in women-owned farms and plantations to source her coffee beans. She met a woman from Colombia when she was just getting into this business who had been widowed. And she had a piece of very equipment, a very expensive farm equipment that needed to be replaced. And this Colombian woman was not able to do that because she could not secure a loan because she's a woman. So this is the kind of thing that Elisa is hoping to change and fix, not only for these individual farmers and co-op owners, but for the entire legislative process. She's 
putting money back into the community so other women can get access to financing, other women can get access to the services that she provides. I think that's a pretty brilliant story. And the last one I'm going to share with you is one of the biggest inhibitors, and I'm sure some of you in this room have run into it. I know I certainly did. When we start families, it's incredibly challenging for a lot of people to find quality, affordable, local daycare, right? The cost in the United States sometimes can be as high as people's housing costs, whether it's a mortgage or your rent. It's prohibitive. So there are two women, Jana Wagner and Jessica Sager, who live in New Haven, near me in Connecticut, who started a program that trains people to open small businesses that are daycares in their communities, and it also helps the people in the community find local licensed quality daycare. So she's working, they're working on fixing both sides of that problem. That is, again, I don't know Tunisia as well, but that is always the biggest problem for people when they're going back to work. So another excellent approach that can be modeled anywhere. This is Amy. Amy is someone that I featured last in my book. I believe that all these wonderful things that we're talking about that women are doing for other women, we cannot do if we don't love ourselves. And what Amy's done is she took herself and she put herself in a very busy city market and stripped down and said, write a heart on my body if you believe in self-acceptance, if you want to show support for my self-acceptance. I think this takes incredible courage. Amy is someone that I have an incredible amount of respect for. I could never do that. Look at how I'm dressed today. I could never do that. And she blindfolded herself. She didn't know what, was gonna, what she was going to find when she took off the blindfold. She's an activist for body positivity and self-care. And I think her message is incredibly powerful. And I, that's why I wanted to make sure you all heard it. And if you choose to, to buy my book, you'll read about it in the book in more detail. Have you ever seen one of these in nature? Right, thousands of birds all making these incredible formations. What if I told you that it's 5% of the birds that determine the direction for the thousands? It is. You're all that 5%. Tiny actions change the world, go change the world. Thank you.